Thumbs up. I guess we are ready. Well, thank you everybody for coming out today. I'm super excited that this is the first time we all get to be in one room. You all don't have to watch on the TV screen. And I feel like there are a few more of you on this side of the room that haven't been coming to the chapel because you've been staying home watching it on TV also. Yeah, I know who you all are. And I might have decided to stay home too and keep my feet up and have my coffee and stuff. But I'm glad everybody is back together for today's program all about wildflowers. I'm going to take you through the spring wildflowers. If I were to add the summer and the fall wildflowers, yeah, well, we'd be here for about four hours. So we're going to stick with our summer ones, starting off with one of the very first wildflowers to bloom. Even when there's snow on the ground, well, even without snow, they bloomed this year. Back in mid-February, this is called skunk cabbage. It's one of the prettiest cups that come out of the ground. Very maroon in color. And deep down in here, well, that's where the flower is, but it's also 85 degrees in there in February, and they will melt the snow that grows around them. But in order to see them, you have to venture out into a marshy, wet area. My clicker's not working. To a marshy, wet area. Heck, nothing is working to advance. There we go. Okay. If you wait until the summertime to go out and see skunk cabbage, then all you see are large green leaves out there. And sometimes that's what people think is skunk cabbage. Well, it is, but you got to get out to see the pretty flower. And yes, it smells actually worse than a skunk <laughs> down inside. It actually smells more like roadkill, decaying animal flesh. But we might not like that smell, but the beetles who crawl inside to pollinate that flower are attracted to that smell. Well, it's definitely not an edible spray and wildflower. It is related to Jack in the Pulpit, who is also not an edible wildflower. Jack in the Pulpit will come up a little later this spring. You'll see the little curved hood. Jack is on the inside. And then Jack gets these beautiful red berries. Just like stuffed cabbage, it has oxalic acid in it, which will stop your lungs from working, which, you know, is why it's not edible. So we always want to be careful. But I like both beautiful purples and reds and maroon colors to them. Now, we didn't get this white stuff this year, but snowdrops we got. Snowdrops are a more domestic wildflower, but some of them have escaped, just like the winter aconites. That's the small yellow ones. You all may have had some in the flower beds here. Down along waterways, along the rivers and streams, you will find clusters of snowdrops and aconites. They have escaped from people's yards. Now, the flower's gone, and all you see are the pretty green leaves of the aconites. And it's now time for their seeds. Well, when I look at any seed pot, one old flower we call the capsule that holds the seed, the seed pod, to me, that's like a second flower. And it deserves us to take the time to look at those seed pods also. You can see the tiny little seeds on the inside of the dried, what were those bright yellow petals. So winter aconites, oh, here's another picture of the aconite seed pod. Now some of the flowers I'm gonna put up here today are ones that, well, 
Well, I walked from my car to this door. I saw many of them. Flowers that grow in the lawn, in the grass, like Veronica. Nice thing about Veronica is she stays real low. And when that lawnmower comes through, cut it. No, the lawnmower does not cut Veronica because she stays super low to the ground. So through the whole spring, you will see these little yeah. periwinkle colored yeah. flowers. And then later in the summer, the flower will be gone. And it kind of just blends in with the grass. They are one of our first lawn flowers to bloom. This year, when we were doing the maple sugaring program in the middle of February, they were already blooming. Oops, wrong way. Now this purple one, you're more likely to find more in the woodlands. So when I mention that a flower is a woodland spring ephemeral, that's because in the woods right now, the woodlands get more sunlight than they will in July. So our summer wildflowers are out in open meadows and fields. Our spring ephemerals are in the woods. This one is called hepatica. Hepatica is one of the plants that taught scientists that oftentimes if a plant is medicinal, good medicine, there's a part of the plant that tells us what part of our body it helps. And hepatica was often used for cleansing your liver. And the leaves look like the shape of your liver. Okay? Uh, beautiful purple. It's one of the few early purple ones in the woodlands. Because trailing arbutus can either be white in color, purples, pinks, even yellows in color. And notice how the flower is just a little different, where trailing arbutus has five petals, and hepatica has six petals. And they're a little more rounded than the trailing arbutus, who really likes their feet to be covered with rocks. That's the best place to find trailing arbutus. And oftentimes it trails and it spreads over top of the rocks you will find in the forest. This next one, I'm still waiting for this one to bloom this year. I haven't seen it come up yet, but I know any day now, bloodroot. And it's actually one of the plants that I'm waiting because as soon as it opens, two days later all the petals fall off of bloodroot. So I often say, if you blink, you miss it. So I want to be there when all of a sudden in our woodland area in the park, you will see them. Before they actually get this beautiful open flower, the stem will be wrapped in the leaf. So here's the leaf. Looks like a big hand. And it covers the stem. And once the stem with the flower bud gets above it, then it will open. So I know that I have a day that I'll be able to see them looking like this, and then the next day it'll look like that. And then a day or two later, the petals will fall off of them, and we will be left with the seed. So that's what this structure is right here. And then you'll see the large leaf all summer long in the woods. And maybe I shouldn't say all summer long, until the leaves in the canopy of the tree shade it out and they turn yellow, which will happen more in June or July. But it's called bloodroot because, well, you can probably guess what part of the plant looks like blood. That would be the root, yes. You know, it's Probably the same clever scientist who named the bird who sucks the sap with a yellow belly. <laughs> named it the blood root kind of thing. But the root does actually give you a beautiful, more rusty than red colored dye. And that's what Native Americans used it as. To get the color rusty red to make a dye. Don't eat blood root. 
because, well, it makes a good dye. <laughs> it is toxic. It is poisonous. So, and I always have to remind myself and everybody else that if you want to use the root of any of these plants that I talk about today, because there will be a few where the roots are edible, we want to always make sure to leave plenty behind. Bloodroot is one of our native wildflowers. It has been here forever, which is why Native Americans utilized it. And we want to make sure that all of our native wildflowers stay out there in the woods, which is why one reason why I didn't pick anything and bring it in today, because I want them to continue growing and spreading. I want all the bloodroot in the park to go to seed so that next year there will be even more blood root. I bet I can walk out here to the flower bed and find bitter cress. It is one of the earliest, and it is an edible wild flower. Bitter cress, yeah, it's a little bitter to the taste, but cress means mustard. And you can tell it's a mustard by looking at the spikes going up. Yesterday I was up at Lebanon Valley College doing an edible plant and insect class for the college students, and they enjoyed eating the bitter cress that I gathered. The green leaves taste delicious, the flowers and even the seeds taste wonderful. And those of you who think, oh yeah, that's right, I remember Lisa is a little crazy. Mm -hmm. You all might eat wild mustards in bag to salads, like this one called winter cress. Take a look at that leaf. You may have seen that leaf in a salad you were eating. Okay? It does not have a bitter flavor. I find wintercress to be nice and sweet. This is what it looks like today. We had a patch of wintercress. We could go out there, have a whole salad from one plant. Next week, because all of our wildflowers are a little early this year, okay? Even our birds that are migrating back are a little early this year, okay? So, next week I know as I drive along the roadside, I'm going to see these yellow flowers. And they're either wintercress, black mustard, field mustard. And unfortunately, I've heard people say, oh, I'm allergic to those. You're not allergic to the crest family. You're allergic to the pollen in the trees that are blowing around at the same time. Okay? I know my black car is yellow today. From all the pollen on all the oak trees and stuff, it just so happens that it, uh, winter crest blooms at the same time those trees are blooming. <coughs> the trees rely on the wind. That's why we sneeze from their pollen. The flower relies on the insects to spread the pollen. So it's not their pollen that makes us sneeze. But if you look at it, the unopened flower might look like a particular vegetable to you. Yes, broccoli. Broccoli is a mustard. When you eat a crown of broccoli, you are eating the unopened flower buds. <coughs> if you leave that broccoli out in the garden, it's going to get little yellow flowers with four petals because it's a crab, it's a mustard. And then if you let it go even longer in the garden, you'll get the seeds on it. Now here's one called penny crest. It has peppery tasting leaves. It has a round pod. Oh, wrong way. Here's Shepherd's Purse. It's another crest. Inside this heart-shaped pod 
are the seeds that can also be eaten and will help continue and cause them to grow again next year. Now we have one mustard. So all these ones I just mentioned are native. They don't take over the world or our gardens, but this one does. This one's called garlic mustard. Okay? This is the one we have to get rid of. This is one that actually is a really good example of if you can't beat it, you eat it. Because you'll never beat it. It always comes back, and it comes back with a vengeance. Because once the leaves go to flower, look at all those spikes. They all have seeds in. I always kind of get kids at the park on nature hikes to pull before they get their seeds. Okay? That way we get rid of them and we won't have that many more. Even one year, I went out with an intern and we gathered up seeds and we actually made mustard. I was a lot younger than them. I thought, well, we're going to save the county park of garlic mustard. We're going to make mustard. Yeah, no, we're not ever going to save the county park from the garlic mustard. I can't make that much mustard and sell it or eat it myself. But all these mustard plants, yes, you can make mustard from the seeds. All you need to do is grind up those seeds, add a little bit of brown flour and vinegar, and you have homemade mustard. One thing I like about eating the unopened flowers of garlic mustard is that it tastes like broccoli with a kick of garlic added. And who doesn't want extra garlic in everything we eat? Okay? So, invasive, chokes out our native plants, which is why we want to help control its population. Ah. So if we count the number of petals on this one, I see four. It's a mustard. It's called Dame's Rockets. Some of you may have thought it was this plant with five petals. I heard somebody say the word phlox over here. Good job. That is phlox. Phlox has five petals. And Dame's Rockets, because it's a mustard, it has four petals. And we will have a spring phlox that blooms, and it stays low to the ground. And then we'll have a summer phlox that gets much taller and blooms. So beautiful pinwheel shape on our phlox plant. Oh, another one, we gotta go to the rocky outcrop areas. Early rock saxifrage. Yes, the name early is in there because it is Blooming in March. I've already seen rock saxifrage on a rocky hilltop already blooming. Oh, my favorite. Oh, and it's also a favorite of chickens because they love the seeds of this plant. This is, I heard somebody say, did someone say chickweed? Yes. Do you like eating chickweed? No, but she knows what it is. Well, thank you. I love eating chickweed. Um, and one thing I like about chickweed is you can find it all winter long. You can find it all summer long, especially if it's growing in the shade. But a neat point about chickweed is Native Americans, not only did they eat it, but this was what they used to predict the weather. And it is way more accurate than the weathermen. <laughs> Not to offend any weather predictors in the crowd, because, but you know, it's the only job you can be wrong 99.9% .9 of the time and still have a job. Okay? I can't be wrong. If I tell you a plant is edible and it's poisonous, I'm not going to have a job tomorrow. So, chickweed, like some other flowers. The flowers close up when it's going to rain. Those flowers don't want to lose their pollen, so they stay closed. And then they'll open.
morning when it's going to be sunny. Okay? Yesterday morning was a very foggy, dewy morning. Every flower was closed up. And I needed open dandelions and open flowers for the class I was teaching in at Lebanon Valley College. I picked them all anyhow, had them in my car. It was a nice warm morning, and they all opened up by the time we got to, I got to oh, Lebanon Valley, and they were ready for doing their part in the program. Um, so watch the flowers, and that will help you know the weather. Now, if only we had a flower that would predict how much snow we're going to get. <laughs> Weathermen would be out of jobs, by the way. So I love eating chickweed. It has wonderful flavor. It's one of those plants that the book tells you it tastes like peas. And it kind of does. It tastes like pea shoots. But to me, it tastes more of the way the hair on corn smells. <laughs> Corn silk. So if you like that corn flavor, I encourage you to try chickweed sometime. If you do want to try some of the edible plants I'm mentioning, make sure you don't gather them from alongside of the road. You don't want to eat the chemicals that are coming off of our cars and the gasoline. You also want to make sure they haven't been sprayed with pesticides and stuff like that and always leaving some behind. This is spring beauty. Beautiful, delicate, little wild flower. And sometimes you look at them and they look white. Sometimes you look at them and they look pink. They do actually have little pink stripes on the inside. But sometimes it gets washed out in the sunlight. Spring beauties actually have an edible root to them, but the root is about the size of a dime. Native Americans used the root like we would use potatoes. But I know they never made mashed potatoes, because they were only this big. But they would use the spring beauty root to thicken soups to make wonderful stews, I guess. So, a delicious root. Well, here's another poisonous one. The one that looks like wash pants hanging on a wash line. That's why they're called Dutchman's Bridges. Okay? You can see, look like pantaloons hanging on the wash line. Dutchman's Bridges are unique in that, well, our pollinating insects cannot get to the nectar going this way, which is the way you would normally go on a flower where the anthers and the pollen are, but they can't get to the nectar, so they go from behind. Bumblebees will chew a hole into the Dutchman's britches in order to get into that nectar. I've watched them, I read about it years ago, and then I have watched the bumblebees do that. They're persistent. They need that nectar. At this time of the year, there's not a lot of flowers out there. So you use the ones that you have a hard time getting to, and you figure out a way to get into the pollen and the nectar. Now, there's one that grows out in the wild that looks similar. It's called squirrel corn. Okay? It's also the plant that was used to crossbreed to create the ones that are blooming in our flower beds right now, bleeding hearts. And again, I thought some of you might think it was bleeding hearts. Nope, this is the wild squirrel corn. Bleeding hearts. Pink. There is a white version of bleeding hearts. And someone told me last year that they found a red bleeding heart at a garden center. I haven't seen the red one yet, but my pink ones are starting to bloom in my flower bed. I'm predicting that, you know, by Sunday, all of them will be blooming. So, bleeding hearts, a gray, or squirrel corn, related to the bleeding hearts. Yeah. A flower with a jagged cut leaf, which is how it gets its name, one way it gets its name. 
This is called cut leaf tooth wart. Because the leaf is jagged and the root looks like a tooth. And the root tastes like horseradish. Oh, it's a delicious one, nice trail snack that you can find. But cut leaf tooth wart, oftentimes along stream banks, hillsides, growing often next to another plant that grows along the stream banks. This is trout lily. Trout lily, the leaves look like a trout, they're speckled. And it used to always bloom around the first day of trout season. Because trout season used to open more towards the end of April. Trout season now opens the last weekend in March. So trout lily is still confused. And it's not opened yet. In the next few days, I have seen some of the green leaves, of course, come first. And then we will see that flower coming any day. But great name for it because it looks and resembles the trout and it's blooming along the back. Another name for it is dog tooth violet. Okay? It's actually in the violet family, not the lily family. So, oh, there's another picture of our trout lily. Ah, oh, this is a plant that in the springtime. Okay, you can walk through it. It'll have a tiny little white flower. It's called cleavers. But if you walk through it in the summertime, it'll stick to you. Now, not only will the seed stick to you, and if it does stick to you, well, then you have snacks for later because <laughs> the seeds are edible. I love those kinds of seeds, the ones that stick to my clothing. And then I walk down the trail and have a little snack there. Um, but so will the entire plant. The whole plant has little sticky barbs on it. They don't hurt you. They just stick to you. I've had kids in the summertime who have pulled them out and then you throw them on somebody and they're all over you. You know, oh wait, they usually just throw them on me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Duh. Cleavers is neat. Cleaver is actually the first plant that was used to make cheese. The sap in the stem of it will curdle milk. Okay? So it has, a, like most of our wild flowers, it has great history. It's also a plant that you can get a red colored dye from the roots of the plant. Historically, red, yes, blood root gave you a more rusty red color. This one also gives you a little more rusty red color, not that bright red that we think of today. The only way in nature to get that really bright red, cochineal beetles. Beetles that live on cactus plants out in Arizona. That's how we got red before they invented red dye number 40. <laughs> I'd rather have cochineal beetles in my things that are red in color. Another name for cleavers is bed straw. It's real spongy in the middle of the summer. Okay? Early pioneers used to put it in their beds and sleep on it. They say it kept the bed bugs away. They make no promises about that because I have kind of put it on me to hope that it would keep the mosquitoes away and it didn't work for mosquitoes. But maybe it worked for bed bugs. At least it was cushy for the early pioneers to lay on the cleavers, also known as bed straw. Mm. Still waiting for this one to come up also, any day now. And once wild ginger comes out of the ground, you'll first see these large heart-shaped, they're shimmery, they're iridescent. You can see purples in them when the sun's shining on them. But then sometimes you really have to look for the flower. The flower lays right on the ground. Sometimes it's covered by leaves, 
Well, it's also pollinated by beetles. Okay? Those flying pollinators have a hard time going down that low and amongst the leaves, but the beetles will crawl in there. I think it's such a beautiful flower because it's not bright and showy. It's not standing tall. You have to actually go looking for it. And while you're down looking for the flower, if you pull up a piece of the root, the root has that wonderful ginger smell, that wonderful ginger taste. And just like the ginger we buy in the grocery stores, it's a wonderful medicinal plant that helps with digestion, upset stomachs. Native Americans used to candy it. I mean, I go to the store and I'll buy candy to ginger, or I'll make my own at home with candy maple syrup, because I like to stick with the Native American tradition, because that's what Native Americans used to candy it. They dipped it in maple syrup. And you can eat the young, tender roots, and you can eat the larger root, and it smells and tastes wonderful. So wild ginger. It's one of the plants I love that when I take a group out and we're on the wildflower trail or somewhere in the park, and I'll, you know, for a whole group, I'll sacrifice one and I'll pull it up and I'll let everybody smell it. It's the one then that goes in my pocket, and I have this nice little patch of wild ginger at home. <laughs> I'm not going to let it die. I'm going to take it home and put it in the ground right away. And I'm still waiting for them to come up this year yet. But the violets have started blooming out in lawns and fields. If you have lots of violets in an area, you have very fertile soil. Okay? I have a ton of violets in my yard where I want to have my garden. And I have my garden there. And I love those violets because I love to eat the flowers. I love to eat the greens. Violets are not only violet color. Violets can be yellow. Violets can be yellow, white with different colors in the center of them. Anytime you see a flower in all the different colors in the center, those are the insect roads or the insect highways. That's helping the insect get to the pollen and the nectar inside the actual flower. So I love the violets. Something you can do, and I've done this before with the violets, is take a whole quart jar of violets and make violet jelly out of them. It has a beautiful purple pink color. And actually, it's one of those things you can change the color of it depending on how much lemon juice you add to it. The purple violet, and I'll go back, oh, go back to the pretty purple violets. Purple violets were the very first thing used by humans as litmus paper or pH paper to indicate if something is an acid or a base. Okay, think back to high school when you dipped that paper and it changed colors and an acid would often make it pink in color and a base would turn it green in color. We can also use purple cabbage water for that. But violets were the first thing. If you squeeze lemon juice on them, they'll turn pink. You know, kind of like if you have a hydrangea, if you put more pine needles at the base of a hydrangea, it'll turn pink. If you have non-acidic soil, it stays a blue color. Okay? So, violets. They're fun to play with. Fun to make that jelly out of them and change the color of the jelly. Now my favorite. <laughs> I usually start with my favorite, but since this is all about the different spring flowers, I wanted to start and kind of go in order of their blooming. I think this weekend we will be at one of the peaks for dandelions blooming. I would never call the dandelion that mean four-letter word. 
Yeah, weed. Because, of course, a weed is just a plant growing where you don't want it to grow. I want dandelions to grow everywhere. I love them in my garden. I love them in my flower bed. Because, well, the dandelion was brought here for its culinary food value and for its medicinal value. The official Latin name for a dandelion is Taroxicum officinale, which means the official medicine. You know, before the pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> you drank dandelion tonics. You ate dandelions because they cured and helped everything. And every part of the dandelion is edible. The leaves, which is another way the dandelion gets its name, dente lion, teeth of a lion. That's what dandelion also means. These greens, especially before the flower comes out, are tender. They are like other wild edibles. They have more nutritional value than the lettuce. High in vitamin D, C, high in potassium. It's a great spring tonic. But after the flower comes out, they get a little bitter. But come on, you all know if you're a true Lancastrian, you put hot bacon dressing on your dandelion greens. Yes. And that hot bacon dressing gets rid of any bitter flavor on those dandelion greens and makes them even more delicious. I know what I'm making this weekend. Because I have not made a batch of hot bacon dressing yet, so I may not wait till the weekend, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> and I will also be gathering the flower heads, and I love to batter dip them and deep fry them. Or make a pancake and just sit them in the pancake. Because it looks pretty, and they taste good, and they're good for me. Or even gathering up the flower heads, steeping them in a little hot water with a slice of an orange or a slice of a lemon, and then drinking that as a tea. Very delicious. If I had the patience and the time, you know, you can also make a dandelion wine out of those flowers. Yeah. And once they go to seed, well now the goldfinch has food. I love when the goldfinches sit on top of the dandelion and eat the seeds. I like to eat the seeds. I don't like the white fuzzy stuff. So you pinch a hold of the white fuzzy stuff and you just bite off those seeds. Now, a few years ago, and it's been several now, maybe six or ten or so, that the Crayola Crayon Company ruined my day one day. They got rid of dandelion colored crayon. How else are we going to draw in color crayon? I know. As you stand over there, I, was, I heard it on the radio on the way to work. What a way to ruin your day when the dandelion's your favorite flower and Crayola's getting rid of the color dandelion and replacing it with another shade of blue. <laughs> Because there weren't already five blues in the box. So, yeah, I'm slightly over it. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> Actually, funny story that goes along with that. I remember telling other people and telling one of the Girl Scout troops that I work with regularly. And when they came the next time, they all brought me a yellow dandelion crayon oh. from their box. So I knew how to feel it. I can still draw dandelions oh, okay. with my crayons. So, gotta love the dandelion. If there's a patch of grass that doesn't have dandelions, I'm not walking through it. <laughs> you know, especially in some of those developments where they just spray all those dandelions. So I love the dandelions. Related to the dandelion is chicory. See, nobody has a problem with chicory because it's a pretty purple flower. It is in the dandelion flat uh, family. If you go to Louisiana, you get chicory root in your coffee. You get roast dandelion root and add it to your coffee. I love in the middle of the summer when they're not mowing often because maybe we're in 
really drought and the grass isn't growing much or we haven't gotten a lot of rain, that's when you'll start to see chicory growing in a wide variety of places. Otherwise, you'll see it more on the edges of the roads where they don't mow. It's out there. Like Dan Wine, it has a tap root. You know, those people, I saw a lady this morning on my drive to work out there in her yard with her long pointed fork digging up the dandelions. You know, I knew that's what she was digging up because I saw her holding one and you could see the root. I always have to chuckle because, you know, a small piece of that root that gets left behind, it's coming back. <laughs> right? That's why that chicory, even though it gets mowed over year after year, it's under there. Those roots are just waiting for an opportunity to not get mowed over. So, chicory. A few other purple ones who are blooming right now. Ground ivy. Gill over the ground. Creeping Jenny, crawling Charlie is another name for it. Yeah. It has a square stem. All mints have a squared stem, but not all squared stems are mints. Cleaver, the bed straw, has a squared stem. It's not a mint. This one is a mint. If you rub the leaves of it, it has a wonderful minty smell. I will occasionally just put it in my bottle of tea to get that nice minty smell. Although in my garden, it's not my friend. Because it's a mint, it really spreads. Although I've learned to like it in some places in my garden because I've learned that if I let it grow in my strawberry patch, sometimes it hides the strawberries from the birds. Makes it harder for me to go find the strawberries underneath all the ground ivy, gill over the ground. Keep creeping Jenny, crawling Charlie, all these different names that people have given it over the years. It is an unwelcomed plant out in a horse pasture, though. It is poisonous to horses. Okay? I asked a friend years ago who had her own horses, well, how does the horse know not to eat the ground ivy? It's the smell. If they step on it, you can smell that minty aroma coming from the ground ivy so they don't eat it. It is a good plant to dry out like Native Americans did and make tea out of it in the winter time because it helps with colds and congestion. Looking similar to the ground ivy, but having a more fuzzy-like leaf and a smaller flower, this is purple dead nettle. This is the plant you see right now in every farmer's field that they have in cloud recently, where they're not growing winter wheat. It's all over out there. It's also a mint, but does not have the strong minty aroma as the ground ivy does. And then in the same family, with a purple, almost hot pink colored flower, this is called Enbit. It's another mint, and it is currently right now blooming out amongst the purple dead nettle and the ground ivy. I, I did that. I'm sorry. The tallest green thing out in the grass. Onion grass. You have the tall greens, and then under the ground you have the onion ball. Yep, they're all edible. Free onions. Come on, better than going to the grocery store. And a whole lot cheaper, too. Now, most people have onion grass in their lawns, but they mow it over. If it doesn't get mowed over, it gets a beautiful purple flower on it. I remember years ago, we had a patch of onion grass growing in the flower bed right outside of my office. And I had to really beg the horticulturalist, don't pull it. 
Can we leave it and let it go to flower? J just this once, please. And he let it. And he got these beautiful purple flowers. And I think everyone who came walking into my office said, what is that beautiful plant? I want it. <laughs> Stop mowing your lawn and you too will have the beautiful flowers of the onion grass. Now, off in the woods, yeah, you'll find onion grass, but you're more likely to find wild leeks or ramps. Okay? Very sweet onion. So, much smaller than the leeks you buy in the grocery store. Okay? But way better for you. More flavor in this smaller ramp. You can eat the whole thing, even the leaves. So here's the onion grass bulbs. The onion grass bulbs are a spicier onion, but the greens are a sweet like a chive. And then you have the ramps or the wild leeks out there. And here's what the seed of the leeks look like. Because oftentimes in the fall of the year in the woods, these are what you'll see. You won't see the greens left behind, and so the seed pod of the leek flower. Oh. You look at this one, or better yet, look at this. Is it invasive or not? <laughs> Clearly it is invasive, okay? Lesser selling dime. If you nowadays go along the creeks, you're going to find it. I remember 30 years ago, this plant was not even in the county park. And now there are places along the Conestoga River, the Mill Creek, that it's really taken over. And now I actually see them in the lawns, away from the creek. Because as people walk, they spread the seeds. And it's in the buttercup family. So here's a buttercup. Buttercups are more in the early summer. Buttercups get about a foot tall. The lesser selling dying stays low to the ground. It has a waxy, shiny leaf that looks similar to the violet leaf. But the violet leaf is not waxy and shiny. Violet leaves are edible, and lemon nine is not. Because I try to give, you know, some positiveness, even of an invasive, one of the positive things is that it blooms early. So all those mason bees and honey bees that came out early this year were feeding on the flowers. Although that's going to make more seeds and that's going to make more lesser selling diet next year. And because they stay low and they've kind of carpeted the stream banks, they're preventing lots of our good natives from blooming. So lesser selling diet. And soon trillium. The plant of threes. This is a plant that people love to go out looking for the trillium. It comes in many colors. When I say plant of three, that's because it has three petals. These green petals are referred to as the sepals. They cover the petal petals, the flower, before they open. And then trillium also has three large bottom or basal leaves, which is why we call it the plant of three. It doesn't matter if it's white or pink or red, even the yellow. This one we would say is variegated because the leaf is not a solid green. This is unfortunately one of those plants that people love. They love it so much that they've helped it become a threatened species. Because when they dig it up and take it home, trillium does not do well in flower beds. It wants to be in the forest. It wants to be amongst the decaying, rotting trees and leaves. It does not want to be in our flower beds. It 
does not want its roots disturbed. And unfortunately, people have caused the trillium population okay. to really decline over the years. Okay? Now, there might be one other species out there that helps the population, unfortunately, decline. And that would be our state mammal, the white-tailed deer. They like to eat it. One of their favorite foods. Luckily, you often find it more in the woods and on the hillsides. Yeah, the deer can get there, but that's not their prime browsing area. But they do. I get sad when I come to an area where there is trillium and all you see are stems sticking up. Because you know the deer were there before me. Beautiful plant. Mertensia. Virginia bluebells. Virginia bluebells are one of the plants that Shanks Ferry is known for the bluebells down there. And it's a great place to go to look for wildflowers, although County Park has all the same wildflowers that Shanks Ferry has, and we have less humans. <laughs> so I recommend the County Park. Okay? Um, but you gotta love those Virginia bluebells. Now here's another one of the deer favorites. This plant is gonna get, looks like an umbrella. It's gonna get a flower during the month of May. And then we'll get a May apple later in the season. May apples. This is one of those plants that don't eat what the deer eat, because they will eat the leaves of the may apples. Talk about finding a patch of may apples with just stems, because they will eat the leaves, which are poisonous to us humans. We can only eat the apple, which is a tiny, tart apple. People typically make may apple jelly out of the actual apple. This is one of those plants that, yes, it's a spring wildflower in the woods. It blooms. But in order for the apple to come to maturity, well, it needs some sunlight. So it's typically only the ones that grow along the edge of the woods that go to full maturity and will produce the apple. So I always think it's okay, let the deer eat the rest of the plant that's in the middle of the woods because it's never going to become an apple. And it takes a May apple seven years of growing to produce an apple. Because as they grow, the first seven years of their life, there's only one umbrella. When they turn seven, like this one right here is over seven, they will actually have a stem that sprouts off into two stems and two umbrellas. And the flower grows in the middle of the two umbrellas. See how the stem has split off? This one's mature enough. Okay? It's old enough, it's over seven years old, and that's why it's producing an apple. And then we have Solomon seal. Solomon seal is originally a native woodland wildflower that has now been domesticated. You can find it in flower beds, although when it was domesticated, it got a lot taller. Okay? In the woods, it stays low and close to the ground. And there is a false Solomon seal, or some like to call it more positively Solomon's plume. Because the flower is just on the end of the plant. I'm going to go back to this. True Solomon seal has flowers that dangle underneath the stem. And Solomon's plume, the flowers dangle out at the end. And one of them's edible and one of them's poisonous. Solomon's plume, which gets red colored berries, are edible. The berries of the real Solomon seal will be blue in color, and they are poisonous. Okay. 
Now I'm in danger, wildflower. I'm sorry. Just like Trillium, people dug up the lady slippers and took the lady slippers home and they didn't do so well. There are pink lady slippers out in the wild and there are yellow lady slippers out in the wild. They are what I think is probably one of the most beautiful orchids. They are in the orchid family. We still have them. You can find them in nice rocky woodlands. Money rocks out in the Welsh mountains and the eastern part of Lancaster County. There are a lot of them. I remember being down in the southern end of Lancaster County at a place called Black Rock Retreat many years ago. And I took a walk at lunchtime, went over the hill towards the river, the Octorera River, and there was a whole hillside of them. I felt like I was a lucky Native American to see that many in one place. I hope they're still there, and I, they probably are because Black Rock Retreat Center is you, know, you have to be invited to go there. It's not just public pro property. But overlooking all those rocks, it was covered with pink ones and yellow ones. One other endangered wildflower is called Shooting Star. We're lucky enough to have this in Lancaster County Central Park still, in a beautiful rocky outcrop area where the public doesn't typically go. It's quite a steep dangerous area, and botany students from Millersville University go out every year and count and tag them. They're just monitoring the population, and they've done that forever, making sure that the numbers there, because it's one of the few patches here in the county where you will find shooting stars. <coughs> And all our little ferns are starting to push their way out of the ground. Of course, the ferns you will see green throughout the winter, and now you'll see the little fiddleheads popping up and out of the ground. Growing close to the ferns and the woods will be wild geraniums, also known as crow's bill because they have quite a point here in the center. Wild geraniums are the plant that taught botanists that we need our pollinating insects. When they took wild geranium to grow indoors, they never produced a seed. There were no pollinating insects to spread the pollen from flower to flower. So I'm grateful for wild geraniums in educating those botanists about the need for insects to spread the pollen. One of the wildflowers you definitely don't want to touch. Oh, if you're from Lancaster, Lebanon Connie's, you call it burn hazel, yes. Because it will burn your butt. Yeah. Stinging nettle, of course, is the scientific name of this plant, whereas some people call it the 10 minute itch. I met a kid at summer camp a few years ago. She said, Miss Lisa, I call it the seven minute scream. <laughs> and I asked her permission to use that and tell other people about that name because I like that name a lot. It just reminds you that you will feel the tingling for a little while, but it goes away. Even though stinging nettle hurts us, it's one of my favorite edibles. Oh, you just boil it in some water, it softens up the little hairs on it, and you eat the plant. I grow it in my gardens. I've already harvested a huge batch of it two weeks ago and dehydrated it so I can make tea all winter long with it. So I have a gallon jar full of dried nettles. And I'll do another batch so I can get through next winter with it because it's a wonderful medicinal plant. And it is the only plant that the red admiral butterfly eats when it's a caterpillar. So we need our nettles out there. We just need, and I like to educate people, just don't walk through it. Okay? And then we'll all be fine. You know, if you're my friend and you come visit my garden, you better know what nettles look like, or you better be careful where you walk. Okay? It's a wonderful plant. Just, yeah, that one 
and two is right. Don't get near this one. Leaves of three, let it be. Leaves of three, don't touch me. People always say poison ivy is red and shiny. It's red and shiny the first day it comes out of the ground. That's it. Then it's green all winter or all summer long. And we have even less poison hemp or poison sumac in Lancaster County and even less poison oak. We have mostly poison ivy. Okay? Either way, don't touch any of them. Poison sumac is actually a tree. Poison oak is a vine, just like poison ivy. You know, this is a perfect example of a tree you don't want to hug. Because <laughs> it hugs back in 24 to 48 hours. Even if you hug it in the winter time, when all is there is the furry vine. Those are the roots. And if you're allergic to urosol oil, it will give you a rash. Most humans are not allergic to urosol oil. I'm going to knock on wood because I'm one of those this right now. I'm not. I've never got poison ivy. But I also know that every seven years your body changes and someday I could develop an allergic reaction to poison ivy. Okay? I hope not. I know a couple of people who they never got it until they had their first child. I hear that changes your body a lot. Well, I'm not having one of them anytime soon. <laughs> so I'm hopeful that I'm not going to get poison ivy. But I always joke with friends who ask me to come over and pull it for them out of their yard. And I always say, if I get it tomorrow, it's your fault. Yeah. No, it's nature's fault. But so far, I haven't had it. But I'm definitely still not going to hug that tree. Okay? I don't touch it. Because if I touch it and I touch somebody else, I can spread that oil to them. Which is often why some people never touch it, but maybe their dog runs through it and gets the oil on them, and then the human gets the poison ivy. While we're talking about poisonous, you might recognize this plant when it looks more like this in the fall. With those berries, you know when the birds eat the poke berries, they then find your white car and your car becomes a purple speckle. It is called poke. Right now, it's just now shooting out of the ground. And when it's under six inches tall, we call it poor man's asparagus. And it's edible. But you better like mushy asparagus because you have to boil it forever in three changes of water. I suggest just eat asparagus. And let the poke out there because once it gets taller than six inches, it's not edible anymore. And the berries are definitely, in the fall, not edible. Clovers are starting to come up in our lawns. Right next to the clovers, we're going to see the Indian strawberries. And if it has a white flower and the same leaves, it's a wild strawberry. These are the delicious ones. These are edible. They just don't taste like a strawberry. And they're one of those plants that most people tell their kids and grandkids they're poisonous. Because they might be, if Kemlon came through. And they don't taste like strawberries. I always tell people, just leave them out there for the birds or the turtles. I will leave them growing in my real strawberry patch in the hope that the cat bird eats those. The cat bird is smart. The catbird knows which one's a real strawberry and which one's not. The catbird also knows that the rocks I painted red aren't really strawberries. <laughs> because the catbird keeps coming back for those strawberries. And then, of course, we have lemongrass. Another heart-shaped leaf with a beautiful little yellow flower. Sweet Sicily. The licorice plant in the woods. Anise. The whole plant tastes like, smells like licorice. The seeds look like licorice seeds, taste like licorice seeds or fennel seeds. And then if we go down towards the water, we will find 
find some water hyacinths, oftentimes variegated with cool leaves, very interesting different yellows and whites and pink, purple flowers looking like bells out there along the waterways. And then the plant that we have to give credit to for us having Velcro, burdock. Burdock gets a beautiful purple flower in the summer. Right now we'll see just the leaves. But if it weren't for the seed head getting stuck to a man and his dog, we wouldn't have Velcro. Because the Velcro, look at Velcro next time, has those little curved hooks that cause things to stick to each other. And as we come towards the end of the spring, our Queen Anne's lace, Queen Anne's lace or wild carrots will start blooming. But a plant right now that looks similar to Queen Anne's lace, poison hemlock. Queen Anne's lace only gets about a foot tall. Poison hemlock gets to be six feet tall. Right now we're seeing the greens of poison hemlock. Yeah, it's poisonous. It's the plant that killed Socrates. Socrates chose to be killed by eating the poison hemlock. Good way to know it's not a wild carrot. It's so tall. It has the purple and the red in it. And it does not smell like a carrot. <laughs> yep, it stinks, actually. And as they are blooming, the daylilies will begin to bloom. Okay? I've seen daylilies already pushing their way up. And I'm waiting for this one to start pushing its way up. You know, I can't talk about flowers without giving a shout out to milkweed. Normally I would swing my bottle around, but it looks like my sticker here is fading away because it does say got milkweed on it. Because as you might know, milkweed is the only plant that the monarch butterfly will lay its eggs on and the caterpillar will feed on the leaves. Well, once that milkweed starts pushing out of the ground, it's summer. So that brings us to the end of our spring a wildflower journey today. Anybody have any questions? Lisa, can I interrupt just a Yes, ma'am. I, I, I was watching the clock there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So great to be back. Great to see all of you. Great to see all of you that I haven't seen for a while. And hopefully next month we'll be in the same room, right? So whatever that topic will be next month, I hope to see everybody down here. And I'll go back more over here. Do you all have any questions, comments, stories?